So they're doing protein assays. So, what are clinical decision limits? Do you guys know? They're based on medical information related to a specific medical condition. Yeah, so how do you come up with those? I think we talked about these a little bit. Yeah, it's where a doctor looks at all the animal and decides on the name. Um, on a decision for the diagnosis. Yeah, how do how they come up with those? Like, if it's this level, they get the diagnosis? The standard, the standardized... Um, yeah, doesn't Brigida cover this too? Uh, in diagnostics? Somewhere, yeah. Uh, not really. You, she, doesn't, she doesn't cover like your... Tr you, you get a certain number of true positive results, false positive results, I, true negative and false negative. I don't remember if she does or not. Yeah, so in the math book, there's actually a, some math problems where we, we calculate prevalence and things like that, positive predictive values and things like that, diagnostic sensitivity, diagnostic specificity. So we'll need to look at those. And then what do you think a true positive is? It's yeah, it's it's a it's a result that's positive that the person does have the disease, and then a false positive is yeah, they they have the disease but they don't, okay, and they have they they get that diagnosis based on the analyte concentration. True negative is that the test says they don't have it and they don't, and a false negative the test says they don't have it and they don't, right? <coughs> So positive predictive values, the probability that the patient with the positive test result has the given disease, and that's going to be equal to the total number of true positives divided by all the positives, right? So that's pretty self-explanatory. The negative predictive value is the exact opposite. Total number of true negatives divided by all the negative results. So. In that math book, there's some examples with all these, and you switch where the, the decision limit is to, to it, it, it's fun stuff. Anyways, I'll just breeze through this, because I did cover it last time when everybody was studying for molecular. <laughs> okay, predictive values and diagnostic efficiency are greatly influenced by false positive and false negative results, obviously, and the prevalence of the disease. Predictive value of a positive result, or PV plus, is, is, it can be defined as the prevalence times the sensitivity times 100% divided by the prevalence times the sensitivity plus 1 minus the prevalence times 1 minus the sensitivity. And there's another equation that does this too, but that's in your math book. There's two, and one's easier than the other to do. Medical decision limits. Those are the, the limits where you, you decide if they're above that, they have the disease, or below that, they don't, or, or vice versa, depending on what kind of analyte you're talking about, right? So as medical decision limits are lower, diagnostic sensitivity increases. Why is that? Because... So... So, so th this is like your scatter of results. This is your analyte value. You have like people without the disease here. And then where's, where's a different color? And then you have people with the disease maybe here. Right? So you have a, do we have another color? Wow, look, I got, I got lots of colors. That's so cool. I, there's even more up here. Don't, don't throw things at me. So, so let's say this is your medical decision limit. Ah, this one doesn't work. I'll throw it at you. <laughs> no, no, like this. So this is your medical decision limit. You know, every it, it's pretty good that you don't have anybody that's red that doesn't have the disease included, right? So 
this so if, if we lower the diagnostic sensitivity, I mean, if we don't lower the, di the decision limit, that's going to increase the sensitivity. Right now, this isn't that sensitive because you've got a, a big group of people here who have the disease that it's not detecting, right? So if we shift this line over here, we make the test more sensitive to detect the disease, but then what happens? You start having false positives. Yeah, you increase the amount of false positives. So, likewise, if the medical decision limits are raised, sensitivity decreases, but specificity increases. So where I drew this line, it's extremely specific. If you test positive, you have the disease. If you test negative, you might, you might not have it, right. Whereas here, where I drew this line, everybody above the line has the disease but there's a bunch of red there that don't have the disease, right? So that, so it, it decreases, wait, no, so sensitivities increase, but it's not so specific. So if you test above it, you might have the disease, but if you test below it, you definitely don't, right? So that's how they, and then <clears throat> there are reasons why you want one or the other, right? So I think, I don't know if you guys were here when I talked about the, 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 the blood banks. They test for viruses like HIV. Do you want something real specific or real sensitive? sensitive. Yeah, you want something really sensitive. So you don't mind having false positives, but you don't want any false negatives, right? So you want to select the level so you only get positive you know you won't you only get true negatives you don't want any false negatives right does that make sense because you don't want to let hiv contaminated blood into the blood system where you're injecting that into somebody and then they develop hiv right so and then likewise if you have a test for something that's not curable but you know you don't want to have a false positive test result for that and freak somebody out where they'll change their lifestyle when they don't have the disease. Do they have like two tests in case? What do you mean? Do they run like two different tests? Oh, for like the HIV? Yeah. Well, yeah, so typically if you test positive at the blood bank, that doesn't necessarily mean you have it. They'll go on and do, you know, tell you that you tested positive, you can't give blood, and then you can go off and do secondary, more accurate tests to really figure out if you have it or not. You're more like apt to get a false positive test at the blood bank just because they don't want any positives. Okay? So factors affecting medical decision limits. And like I said, this the knowledge of, of the distribution of the test results in the disease versus non disease patients. Do you know what PSA is? <laughs> Well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, pr prostate specific antigen. <laughs> and so the PSA test, you know, they, I think they're going away from this now, but you'd get a lot of false positives and people would think they'd have cancer, right? Intended use, intended clinical use of a test. Consequences of false negatives versus false positive, and I already used the HIV blood donor, you know, thing there. And then you have receiver operating characteristic curves, and that basically describes the ability of the test to discriminate between the disease from the non-disease, and it plots the sensitivity versus one minus the sensitivity, and you get plots that look like this, right? And I think you want it curved one way or the other, like the way it is curved. You don't want straight lines, yeah. But this, if you have the old ones, this is the end of the reference. The end of the reference interval chapter. Does that make sense? I think so. Ow. Is that, um, that's go up in the Yes. And then all these plots. But now we'll get to the evaluation of methods. Why are you going to need to evaluate methods in a lab? Why would you need to evaluate any of the methods? 
Well, you want to make sure they're doing the proper the proper techniques so that everything's accurate. And if everyone's doing the same thing, then well, that's evaluating the personnel, right? Yeah. You got to evaluate the methods too. Well, yeah, you got to make sure it's all accurate. You got to make sure that that your the error inherent in that method at that that the way you're performing it is going to be less than that clinically allowable error, right? Sure. Yeah. That sounds good. <laughs> I guess I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, but you're going to do this when you have like new techniques, right? Yeah. So, anytime you in introduce new techniques. Why would you want to introduce new techniques? Save money. Probably the most important factor. Yeah, you could have more accurate or what else? New analytics. What's associated with accurate but not accuracy? Precision. precision, yeah. More precise, increased accuracy, blah, blah, blah. Saving money is right here, reducing reagent and labor costs. You might have new analytes. They discovered this one analyte is associated with something. <laughs> and you want to start diagnosing something, <laughs> right? Or checking patients. So one of the new analytes that I worked with, they, they, they just recently, I think in the past six months, the FDA approved the test. It was, it's a PET scan for amyloid in the brain. So. Do you know what that is? What are you Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh? Not amylase, amyloid oh. plaque. So they, they, they took like a Congo red or thioflavin derivative that can cross the blood brain barrier and you know they make it so it emits a positron and then they can do PET scanning. Get an idea of how much amyloid's in the brain. They do it with Huntington's too? Yeah. Well, yeah, so amyloid's like a general term. Well, there is one protein called the amyloid protein, but it, they all have the tendency to form these cross beta sheet structures where they kind of fall out of solution or these beta sheets. And this class of compounds, thioflavin S, Congo Red, they all bind with high affinity to those beta sheet structures. Insulin will also form amyloids. In the pancreas, so that was a divergent thing. <clears throat> so analytical performance has to be verified experimentally. So that's to maintain accreditation. That's required by CLIA 88, and it's not the same as routine QC, right? What's the purpose of routine QC? Yeah, to make sure that it's running the way it's supposed to. Method evaluation is if you want to test out a new method to make sure it, it can run within the, the allowable error, right? So, um, did I say that here? Routine QC detects errors that significantly exceed acceptable error that, that are present in the method. So, method evaluation is required to assess the inherent methods or inherent errors of the method. So you're just seeing if will this method work for us? Are the errors within our allowable range that we need for the assay? So, so relate those errors to the medical and regulatory requirements. So, so you're going to test the method, see what the errors are, and see if you can use them medically, clinically and if it's going to be within the law. so, And then it also helps you select the effective quality control procedures. So manufacturers of methods, they're, going to, they're, they're, they're required to make claims about the analytical performance you know, of those methods. So they do these clinical trials, large scale, and they show, tell you that this method has this much variability and this much precision. Those are the same thing, right? This much bias and this much precision. <laughs> so the FDA offers documents to make sure appropriate testing standards are followed. So they have to submit all these documents and then they get reviewed and they have to be, the claims that they make have to be supported by documented method evaluation studies, similar to like pharmaceuticals. Medical requirements of the method. So does the method meet the requirements of the final user? 
excessive error can result in misdiagnosis, right? If you have a lot of error, you can misdiagnose people because if your variability is high, all of a sudden you'll start getting healthy patients that are way out over there, right? If you have increased variability, more variability than you, you need. But this medical decision level, which is going to be one of these lines here, right? This medical decision level is where you need to test what, how much error you have, right? Because that's going to be where you want the, the least amount of error, because that's where people are making decisions about people's medical decisions. Uh, the, uh, the medical conditions, right? I don't know how to talk. So excuse them all. <laughs> Performance levels at these medical decision limits or levels with allowable error can be formulated. So they have what's known as allowable error. And there's tables in this chapter in the book telling you about the allowable error. Method evaluation involves estimating the error at the medical decision level and comparing with the clinically allowable error. And if all your error that you sum up is less than the allowable error, then that method is okay to go, right? So goals for the precision of a method used for group testing. <clears throat> so these developed in 1976, I'm dyslexic too, I was going to say 67, provides the basis for the use of intra-individual and intra-individual biological variations in determining goals. So what they, 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 they look at the analyte variations within the population. So analytes are going to vary within one individual. We, we've talked about some of those. And then they also vary, you probably get a little more variation between people. Just like intermolecular and intramolecular forces, it's intra-individuals within one person, what the normal variation within one person is. Inter-individuals, that they analyze how it varies between people, okay? So the analytical coefficient of variation could be, is going to be equal to half the square root of the, co, you know, the coefficient of variation within one person plus coefficient of variation squared within you know, people. So, but if you need more precision for a method, you only look at the intra-individual changes, and that's half the square root of the square of the coefficient of variation of the intra-individual variation. And then the allowable bias based on biological variations can also be calculated and that's signified as BA and that's equal to one quarter and it's basically the same as this, right? It's half the CVA, right? Does that make sense? What is bias? Everybody, nobody gave me the answer I was looking for on the test, so I, I didn't count it wrong on anybody. When I asked you to calculate the bias, nobody did. The last question? There's one of those last questions. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, the last question was, just had something else is like, no. Well, that was the easy part. Well, this is a super easy calculation, too, for bias, but nobody told me this is the bias for these two methods, right? Do you know what the bias means? You know what the bias is? What question was it? Oh, I don't remember. It's the one where it was, um... There are two different methods, and you had to calculate the... Precise, which one was more accurate, and I asked to calculate the bias for both, but nobody ever. You didn't see that question. Yeah, but the bias is actually the number, the 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 the, the, the average dif difference from the true value that the machine has from the real value, right? That's what the bias means. It's a systematic error, and we're talking about that here. So I thought maybe I hadn't covered that because really it gets covered much in this chapter. Then, so I didn't count anybody wrong on that because I blame myself. Bad huh? Bad yeah. <laughs> but know what the bias is. We're going to talk about bias more when we actually look at these examples for comparing different methods. 
the performance standards based on proficiency testing. What's proficiency testing again? Come on, cap those proficiency testing, right? Ow. So those are those outside groups that give you samples and they test how well you do compared to everybody else or all your peers. So it's basically the groups that compare you to your peers and tell you where you lie statistically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so government speci specifies the allowable error for proficiency testing for a number of the analytes. So the government will tell you that you know there's a certain allowable error. Labs have to select, evaluate, and monitor test methods to have confidence methods will meet proficiency testing requirements which are given as the fixed limits on the amount of variability or a limit expressed in terms of a fixed percentage of the concentration or activity. So what do we mean when we say activity? We haven't gotten to that chapter yet either. Like cellular activity? It's not cellular activity. Like I don't know. So some of the tests you guys will run, like let's say for example your liver enzymes, they'll give you activity units for those rather than like milligrams per deciliter, it's international units per something. So activity is just, it's basically how, instead of testing the, the physical presence of the enzyme, you test its activity and, and you treat it with a substrate and measure how much gets converted to product or vice versa based on the amount of enzyme that's there. So that's what activity is. It's not a concentration. It's the activity of the enzyme you're testing. And we actually will do a lab where we measure your alkaline phosphatase activity in your blood. So three standard deviation limits which are based on the overall peer groups. Huh? What was that? Oh, I thought so. you guys were giving me applause. I was shocked. That's really what I was doing. I don't think so. Plus or minus two dilutions for assays reported in units of titers. So. So. You got to select methods in the lab. So first, you, you need to, the way you select a method is you need to determine the need for the lab, then you have to define the requirements, you know, what it's going to be applied for, the method that, 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 that's used, and then the performance also that's required. And then, so once you define, determine the need, define the requirements, you're going to review the literature, and then select candidate methods. So. So do you think when you're selecting a method, are you, you're, you're evaluating methods, do you think you're going to just evaluate all the possible methods and then just pick, pick the best one? You're going to do a study with each kind of method and see which one is best? Or are you going to select candidate methods? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it costs a lot of money to do all this and the methods are really expensive too. So. You're going to select candidate ones and do, do a lot of research beforehand to get an idea whether this one might be appropriate and then you select it and then you test to see if it is appropriate or how you can tweak it to get it the error down. So application characteristics that you're going to look at is what kind of sample size there are, what, how many tests you're going to run, how fast those tests need to be turned around. So you got to look at how fast the turnaround time is for that method. Sample throughput rate. What's the throughput rate? Shock put. Throughput is basically the number of samples that can go through the through the machine at one time. Or like our 96 well plate reader will read 96 wells with one run, right? That's so it's got 96 well throughput. Huh? Yeah, but if you plug that in during 96 wells, it would take forever in a day. No, it wouldn't. Because it, it measures all 96 wells anyways, every time you put it in there. It measures all 96 wells. It only reports the ones you highlighted. Yeah, so if you had several things on one, you run the plate once, and if you just switch 
the things, it'll tell you the results for those without rerunning it. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? Yeah. <laughs> now you're telling it which ones to include in your graph and, and data. Yeah. <laughs> So you got to also know what the specimen type is, right? Is this going to be for your analysis, CSF, et cetera? Automated quality control review. A lot of these new methods will have automated quality control, and it, it, it keeps track. So rather than you writing out those, those Levy Jennings charts, the computer that runs the machine keeps a Levy Jennings chart in its file. And when it fails those WestGuard rules that you you know, the way you have it set up in the machine, it'll flag you and say you gotta, you know, there was this, uh, what's it, a 13S rule violation or so forth, 22S, R4S. So, that was always my favorite, the R4S. <laughs> what does it mean when you have a R4S? Yeah, so it just means your 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 precision has gone way bad all of a sudden, right? <laughs> way bad? Yeah. <laughs> so there's self-diagnostics on some of these machines and that helps helps you out. Lab space required is important. A lot of hospitals have limited space for their lab. And some of these automated machines take up like this whole room. <laughs> Did you see the one in Brazil? No. Nah. You should check it out. Their entire lab is on it. I've seen the lab at North Florida, and it's got like one big. It's not this big, but it probably takes up this amount of the room. And you put the put the vials in. It runs by a scanner centrifuges them if they need to be centrifuged and then sends them to the different machines <laughs> and it takes a sample from each one. Yep. <laughs> well if you like go to the micro or hematology lab I think that's more hands on. Well, micro has become all rapid tests. Yeah. So that's going to be button pushing too. So. In the future. Yeah. Somebody's got to do the quality control though. Yay, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You also got to consider, you know, because a lot of these require lots of reagents. You need storage space for those. Is that storage going to have to be refrigerated or frozen? Availability and skill of the laboratory staff, right? You got to have staff that are going to be able to run the machines properly. <laughs> yes. There's a special technique to push that button. <laughs> You need the time available to train people and then the cost per, per test, right? If you reduce the cost per test, the more money the hospital can make or the lab. And then safety and environmental hazards also. You don't want to be putting all your workers in. Yes, except it's useful. <laughs> So method characteristics you want to look at, look at, does the method have the necessary chemical specificity? And I got that up, I was going to ask you, I should take that down. What does specificity mean? It means free from the interferences and chemical sensitivities, the ability to detect really small quantities, or changes in analyte concentration. Are there matrix effects? What are matrix effects again? You know, what is the matrix? Of a sample. Yeah. <laughs> huh? <laughs> it's not real. It's very real in, in, in the lab. Um, so, oh my God, I forgot the matrix to work. Um, All the red rabbits? Nobody can remember what the matrix is? It's been a long time. It's like count one. Did you 
No, that's not even Calc 1, that's yeah, like 3 Calc. No, that, that's math. This has nothing to do with that math. But when you say matrix, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> yeah, you are a math person, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> so, serum, plasma, whole blood, CSF, urine, those are all different matrices. So it's the composition of the material you're testing. So sometimes there's matrix effects that interfere with different analytes or with an assay. Okay? So you want to know what matrix effects there are? Well, because because a lot of times you dilute samples in some kind of solvent, right? So the, the matrix is, is like you got all that albumin and IgGs and whatnot and serum and plasma, that those can have effects on immunological and activity assays and things like that. So reagents, temperature, reaction time, measurement time, and measurement approach are all characteristics that should be well defined also. So when, when you go to evaluate the method, the method evaluation studies are done to determine if the selected method yields the acceptably small analytical error. Quantitative estimates for random and systematic error are the goal of the study. So we already know, what is random error? Another word for random error? Chaos. Um. <laughs> Statistically speaking, what is random error in statistical language? We're doing so good today. I know. So you remember that, 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 you have the bullseye, you know, one is the, this, yeah, so, so one of these is that and one is the other, so you have random, oh, accuracy is random, no, <laughs> precision is random, <laughs> Your accuracy is your systemic error, or, or AKA the bias. So, systemic error and bias are, ac are accuracy. Random error is your precision, your scatter. Okay? You had a 50 50 shot? I tried. <laughs> At least I tried. Yes. So. <laughs> Basically, that's why you're evaluating the method. You want to quantify estimates for both the random and systemic error, and, and then you sum those and determine if, if they're below your allowable error. So if these estimates, they may be invalid if certain assumptions are not true, right? So if you're testing these to try to come up, if you're trying to come up with an estimate for this error and the operators aren't familiar with the assay, do you think you'll have more error or less error? than you normally would. Probably more, so that's gonna throw off your, your estimates for that error. Stability of the calibrators, controls, and reagents. If they're not stable, that's gonna throw your error off. And same thing with the linearity of the response. So, so random analytical error, random analytical errors are those that, are, that affect reproducibility of the measurement. They can be, are, are all caused by like the instability of the instrument. So it could be electronic instability, or if it, you know, just is missing a foot. Variations in temperature, you get variations in temperature throughout a day in all buildings, even if they try to keep it the same, those variations in temperature are going to affect electrical signals, which will affect output signals, right? Variability in handling techniques, such as pipetting, mixing, and timing, right? So all the, what, what's so funny? My zipper down. <laughs> so variability in handling techniques, right? Everybody's going to handle things differently. So that's one addition to the random error. And then, which is also the variability in operators, right? One person can handle things differently, and then all people handle things a little bit differently, too. So those all sum together to add to your random analytical error. And here we have some of the components of random error variation. Within run variation is de designated like that, sigma WR, specific steps, procedure, 
can cause that sampling, pipetting, short-term temperature variations, and stability of the instrument, right? So that's within one run, you might get variation. And then what's another type of variation? Between runs, right? But within a day. So between runs, within a day, instability of calibration curves, right? Because if you do a, a different calibration curve for the next run, that can throw off your what? System, your, your bias, probably. Longer term variations in the instrument, small changes in the condition of the calibrator and reagents and changes in condition of the laboratory during the day. AKA also the fatigue of staff near the end of a shift. They're, they're on top of their game or they're waking up for the first shift and then maybe they're on top of their game at the end of the shift because they're about to get off or they're tired. Then you have between day variations, which are variations in the instrument that occur over days. This could be changes in the reagents and calibrators and different staff. So that all goes into this variation, random error variation. And they can be summed like this, you know, because you have to square the standard deviations to, to, to sum them up to get your variation. And that's your total random error variation there. Systematic and that analytical error, and trueness is another word you can use. So systematic error tells you the trueness. It's a way to calculate the bias or your inaccuracy, right? Describes that it describes error that's consistently low or high, right? So you're consistently off this target this way or this way or somewhere like that. So consistently, the mean that you get is consistently off. If it is consistently low or high by the same amount, regardless of analytical concentration or analyte concentration, that means you have a constant systematic error. So could you think of somewhere where it might not be constant? Sure, right? So as you increase the concentration of, of, of it, it could cause a, a larger one, right? So that would be like proportional. That error is proportional. Uh, proportional systematic error, right? If, if it's proportional, and this is an example from your book, you have proportional error where you have, when you, your measurement's really slow, low, not slow, you don't have much systematic error, but as you increase the measurement, you increase in that systematic error too. So your bias will be greater and greater the larger the values are for whatever analyte. And this is the example of constant error. Never changes, it's always off by that certain amount. Huh? So when you're going to do experiments in the lab to, to, to measure these errors, this is how it's normally, normally what? Organized, right? So you test your random error, you're gonna do per preliminary experiments, they're gonna be like your replication within run experiments. You're gonna use pure materials and gradually start testing real samples. To test constant error, you test interference, you do use interference studies. For proportional error, you're going to do recovery studies. And other systematic errors, you're going to check the linearity and check limits of detection, limits of quantification and whatnot. But finally, these are short term. And then as, it, as you go on, you want to do replication run to run, where you test the variation between runs and use real samples. And then you also want to compare it with a comparative method, something that you know works well and see how this new method compares with that. What would be a good way to do that? It's gonna be like linear regression, right? So you can, and we'll see that. So random error estimates from repl replication studies, you're gonna do within run replication experiments. They're the simplest type and should be done first. The matrix should be the same as the intended patient samples. So if you're gonna be running plasma, or serum samples, the matrix of these test samples should be plasma or serum. The random error estimates are generated by consideration of repeated analysis of the same specimen. So you're going to test the same specimen over and over and over and over again in one run and come up with an estimate for the random error, which is going to be four times that standard deviation. <coughs> 
constant error estimates from interference studies. So interference studies are going to measure the constant error caused by the presence of a substance thought to interfere with the test. So I think caffeine interferes with theophylline. What are some other interference, the more common ones? I think we talked about them last time or the time before. I forget. We talked about it recently. There's the three most common interference in plasma samples are <laughs> so that would be a chemical substance, but I don't know what cocaine interferes with. But, but, but these interference, they're common. And one of them has to do with the patient's diet. The other has to do with the, the, the person taking blood and treating the blood samples. The third has to do with the patient's disease they have. Not liver enzymes, but... Yeah. Oh, the, the icteria. There we go. That's icteria is one. So, what, what's the one that has to do with the diet? Um, the, uh, just I know. <laughs> so, if you're taking patient samples after they eat a big greasy meal at, at Burger King. Yeah, they're going to have lots of chylomicrons or VLDLs, and that interferes with samples too. And the third one is having to do with the technique when they drew the blood, most likely, or, or t taking the s samples out of the blood. Oh, hemolysis? Yeah, hem hemolysis. Those are your most common ones. And I think your book actually uses examples of those in the little paragraph that you're reading. So. And then proportional errors estimated from a recovery experiment. And this is almost like what you did with the weights, where you uh, have two samples with known amounts, and then you, two samples, the same samples, and then you spike one with a known amount, and you measure both, and you see if you can recover that known amount. I got a picture of it later. It involves the addition of a known amount of analyte in it to an aliquotted sample. The sample's divided into two. One is spiked with a stock solution containing the analyte. The other receives an equal volume of the diluent that contains that analyte, right? And the two samples are analyzed. Are, are analyzed. The difference between them indicates the amount of added analyte that's recovered. So if you should recover the same amount, plus or minus some error factor, right? So these are the recovery and interference experiments. So you add a known amount of analyte to three or more patient samples, analyze them in triplicate. So U plus minus U. So this is added, and then this is what was there before, and then that's going to equal the recovered amount, right? And your recovered amount times 100, or the fraction that you recovered times 100, divided by, you know, plus is going to be equal to the percent recovery. And you want the percent recovery, the goal is going to be between 95 and 105 percent, right? Does that make sense? I don't know if you like this figure. This is the, the sample, and then this is the sample plus some amount of known analyte, and you test both. So, so the interference experiments, you're going to add a known amount of possible interference to three or more samples. Okay, and then <clears throat> you're going to, you know, you get a result. If you have the interference, you know this, and this is the one without the interference. Hopefully, if there's no interference, this is going to be zero, right? The concentration of the one with the interference minus the concentration of the one without the interference. It should be zero, and that gives you the percent recovered or the percent interference, and the goal is approximately zero. You don't want interference. So, error caused by nonlinearity. Initial linearity can be carried out using aqueous standards to ident identify the capabilities of the me method in an ideal specimen matrix, right? So, if it, it's linear in water or aqueous, hopefully it will be linear in the matrix, too. 
So you're, you'll follow that one up with the matrix. So you have different concentrations of the analyte and you see that you have a nice linear response between the signal from the machine and the concentrations that you spiked. You do it with, with the right matrix and that'll tell you if there's matrix effects, does matrix affect the linearity. Comparison of the two can give you an idea about the matrix influence on that method. What do you think the sensitivity is? We talked about it earlier today. <laughs> so the sensitivity of an assay is the ability to detect small amounts or small changes. So one of the definitions is the limit of detection. Okay. Then you also have the limit of the blank. And the limit of the blank is the, basically the highest value you're going to get from a zero sample. And th this is all done statistically, too. So the limit of the blank equals the mean of all your blank samples plus some z-score times the standard deviation of those blank, blank samples. And typically, they're going to use a z of two or three, right? I forget what your book says. It might even be a little bit bigger. So the limit of detection is the minimum concentration of the analyte whose presence can be qualitatively detective under defined conditions. What does that mean, qualitatively detective? Yeah, it's there or it's not there. It tells you nothing about the concentration. You can just say, oh, we detected it, but we can't measure the concentration. And that's because you might be at the limit of detection, you're above the limit of detection, but you're not yet at the limit of quantification, which is the next one. But this one, basically, it includes the upper confidence limit of the blank plus two to three times the standard deviation of the results of a spiked sample whose concentration is close to this value. So you get an idea of what the, the minimum level of detection is, and you're going to have several samples that are spiked with that amount you get the standard deviation for that, and then you can define the limit of detection as the average for the blank plus, you know, a couple standard deviations of that blank, so you're at, at the confidence limit of the blank, plus a couple standard deviations of the, the spike sample. So you know you're just a little bit above. I used to ride those when I was a kid. <laughs> yes. That was what, about 1,000 years ago? I think you should do like creationists of this world 4,000 years ago. I'm not that old, but I, they were still around when I was around. And that was about a thousand years ago, I think, the dinosaurs. <laughs> what? Jesus were dinosaurs too. Yes, you knew that, didn't you? So, limited detection, that's what we just talked about. And then we have the limit of quantification is the minimum concentration of analyte whose presence can be quantitatively measured reliably under defined conditions. You hope the Knackles people don't watch these videos. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Is that why they're videoing us now? Probably. Yeah, oh, man. Like I'm so, sorry, guys. <laughs> I've let you down. Ah, I can't even hold a pen. <laughs> I haven't, no. <laughs> So the lowest concentration at which the precision performance of the measurement is less than the allowable error. So, so to come up with the limit of quantification, that means your, your precision of that has to be below that allowable error. Precision and accuracy. So you have to, you know, that, that's the point at which that allowable error is less than your uh, limit of quantification. Or that's the, the level where you... The, the variation is small enough, right? And this is a picture from your book which shows you how the three might relate. 
with uh, population histograms. This is, these are all your blank samples and the kind of value that you get and the frequency that you get for those. The limit of, and so they set the limit of the blank is basically your, your upper 95% confidence level. Then the limit, limit of detection is here and then your limit of quantification is here. So your limit of quantification could be the same as your limit of detection, but you can never have your limit of detection greater than your limit of quantification, right? So, so <clears throat> once you've evaluated the study, you're going to do these final evaluation experiments where you're going to do between day replication experiments, which is an expansion of the within run experiments over many days, usually at least 20, needs to be long enough to allow random effects that occur over several days to influence the long-term estimate of random error. So what kind of random effects might you want to include? So it's going to be the same when you're coming up with your reference intervals, right? You're going to want to do it different lots of materials maybe and different users, right? Does that make sense? Comparison of methods experiment. So this is where you're going to compare it, and it helps you determine the systematic error of the method using real patient specimens. Specimens are analyzed using the new method along par in parallel with an old method that's known to be accurate and precise. Systematic differences between the two are interpreted as errors of the new te test method. <clears throat> so we talked about traceability before like, of reference standards and reference materials, things can, the, the, the calibrators are traceable back to their reference standards. So traceability can document the quality of the comparative method, a system of credentialing, reference materials, and reference methods has been established by IUPAC and the IFCC called the Joint Committee for Traceability in Laboratory Medicine. So accuracy is transferred from these reference materials to reference methods down to routine test methods at several stages, so it goes like back and back and forth and back and forth, and hopefully you're comparing your method to one of these methods that's been traced, and then once you do that, the new method, you can trace it back to the reference method, right? Accuracy or trueness is more important than relative accuracy based on the comparison of a new method to another routine method, right? And this is the figure showing you the traceability. You have your first degree reference material, your first degree reference method, and it goes down, down the way, right? So how they all get traced together. T statistic is going to help you determine what the bias is. What do you think you, you, you you're, what's the null hypothesis? Do you think that you're going to do for this T statistic? You're going to say that the bias is equal to zero, right? That those two, there is no bias. And that's what you're shooting for, too, right? So the systematic differences between the tests and the comparative method are estimated most easily with the comparison of methods, method by bias. <laughs> A lot of methods there. Bias indicates the magnitude of the systematic error between the two methods. So you can test that, and it's basically... So do you know what we're talking about? You take one sample, test it in one method. You take another aliquot of that same sample and test it in a different method. And then you have the two different results, which are going to be yi and xi. The difference between those results tells you the bias, but then you're doing more than one sample. So that's why they have the little i's here. So it would be y1, x1, the difference between those. And then it's divided by the total number of samples done. So it's kind of like the mean of the difference between the two machines, right? Huh? So the bias equals the sum of all of these differences divided by the total number of samples that were looked at. And when I mean total number of samples, you don't include one, two, it's like one, and then y2, x2 would be two, you know what I'm saying? So, so that, that's what we mean by total number of samples. Likewise, you're going to detect the standard deviation about the bias, and that's basically how variable it is around the bias, because you're going to have variability, right? And the standard deviation of the bias is very similar to your equation for standard deviation. 
you, the difference between two individual data points subtracted by the bias squared divided by n minus one and take the square root of that. So it's almost identical to your normal standard deviation equation, right? It's just looking at the, the standard deviation of the bias or of the difference rather. And the statistical significance of the bias is determined by using the t-test. And the t-statistic can be calculated by the bias times the square root of the n divided by the standard deviation of the dis difference, right? So, and then your null hypothesis, you want the, the bias to be zero, basically, right? So, <laughs> the correlation coefficient, the correlation coefficient r indicates the degree of correlation between the two methods, right? So you, you're looking for a correlation as close as possible to one. If you have a correlation of one, that means like your slope between the two is one, so every point matches up perfectly. You get, what? It shouldn't be negative one. Because remember, you're comparing one method to the other. So you're measuring the same samples in one method as the other. So if this is one, two, three, four, five for method A, this is one, two, three, four, five for method B. If you have a sample that gets a value of one for method A, you're kind of hoping that sample is going to have one for method B, right? If there's no bias, they're going to have one. If it's negative one, then there's something seriously wrong with the new method. It's giving you opposite results, right? So if you have a correlation coefficient of one, it means it's a positive correlation and it's almost perfectly aligned. So if you have zero correlation, you might have something like that, all right? Does that make sense? So you're looking for a correlation of positive one. So, so it's not like a correlation coefficient where you're doing uh, comparing two different things like the height of men and their blood glucose levels or something. Or that could have a negative correlation. You always should have a positive correlation when you're comparing two different methods, right? And so, so this, your book mentions these. So like if you just look at the range of the data, that can have a, a big effect on your correlation coefficient, right? So here we're just looking at Billy Rubin data between one and zero and two. And you get a sc scatter plot like this. This is the same data, but you start including more data points and then even more data points up here. So this looks much more correlated, right? These are kind of outliers at the, the high end, which totally increases your correlation coefficient. Your R up there, right? 0.95 versus down here, it's only 0.773. So that's something to, to look at. The scatter and the data can throw off that correlation coefficient. Then linear regression statistics, if the two methods are comparative and an, an xy plot would resemble a straight line, which can be described by the linear regression expression y equals a plus bx. And ideally, b should be 1, right? Like we just discussed here, it should be 1. Random variation between the methods would be indicated by the standard error of the estimates, the syx, aka the standard deviation of the residuals. <clears throat> so systematic error at XC, what is XC? Oh, damn, I put it right there, didn't I? <laughs> so that's the decision level concentration, right? So that's the, the important place to measure your bias and your error. So if you do linear regression, you're, you're going to see what your bias is, is at XC. So you plug XC in for xi and calculate what yc is. So you, you, you determine, you know, the bias right there at the critical medical decision limit, limit right? So systematic error is acceptable if the absolute value is less than the allowable error budgeted for the, the method. So, and this is another figure they show you, effective showing you the effective range on the linear regression statistics again. So if you're only looking at from 0 to 200, it's going to give you smaller standard error, smaller y-intercept 
and it's slightly different slope than if you concentrate on this little bubble in there, right? Because <clears throat> it spreads the data out, gives more weight to those values that are spread out. So you've estimated all the error for these groups. You have to total the error estimates. So the random error and the systematic error are combined to estimate the total error of that method. So, and this kind of shows you that. So you have your true value and your observed values scattered out. So this is your precision. And the difference between this and this is your bias, your systematic or analytical error. This is your analytical error. So your total error is going to be from the true value all the way to that you know, 95% confidence limit here, or two SDs basically across your precision. And that gives you your total analytical error. Why, would you, why wouldn't you just want to do it here to the middle? That would just be your systematic error, right? Or why wouldn't you do it to here? Because your random error, you get values between all the way here, right? You want to include the total amount, worst case scenario. Does that make sense? Total allowable, this is another one. So your true mean, your mean with your scatter across that mean, two SDs past that gives you your total error then. <clears throat> and this, this, this figure here shows you typical CLIA limits would be, right? They're way out there. So this one would pass for total allowable error. Then we have these medical decision charts, or OPSPECs, QC charts. They're developed by Westgard, and it shows the interrelationship between standard deviation bias and allowable error. Shows that the combination of random error and standard or systematic error, your bias, charts divided into regions according to magnitude of standard deviation. And it's unacceptable, marginal, fair, good, and six sigma. Have you guys ever heard of six sigma? So that's what everybody's shooting for. And you get these charts that look like this. So you plot basically your percent, standard deviation as a percent of allowable error and then the bias as a, as a percent of allowable error, and the bias or systematic error as percent of the allowable error, and you're shooting for a range down here. And you're, you're good all the way to marginal, but then above that is unacceptable, right? So. <clears throat> I got problems. Ever since you told me that they're watching me. <laughs> so a confidence interval criteria for judging analytical performance, right? So we, we've just come up with estimates for the total amount of error, but those are just estimates. So rather than do, using estimates, we're going to use confidence intervals to estimate the error, right? So exact measurements of random and systematic error cannot be obtained from the limited number of specimens analyzed. So. And the approach by Westgard, Carey, and Wold, 95% upper and lower confidence limits of error are calculated. So if the 95% upper limit is of error is smaller than the allowable error, then at least 95% of certainty that the estimated error is acceptable, right? So rather than using the estimated errors, you're going to cal calculate little confidence intervals for those, like on this chart. This is what our total error is, but really there's going to be little error bars here, and we're going to take the one that's further away as our estimate. Does that make sense? No? Yes? So, if the 95% lower limit is greater than the error, the allowable error, there's at least 95% certainty that the error is not acceptable, right? <clears throat> so confidence interval criterion for random error, the true standard deviation is not known for random error. We just came up with an estimate for the standard deviation. So the upper and lower confidence limits of the standard deviation can be calculated by multiplying the observed standard deviation by the appropriate one-sided 95% factors. 
and you, this is the equation for that, right? So you have your standard deviation, <clears throat> the random error measured upper limit is going to be equal to the mean estimate for your for the, for your error plus that a u, and you look that up in a table to get that factor, not plus times. Sorry. So. So random error lower limit is going to be four times STML. And the random error upper limit is four times the STMU. So confidence interval criteria for constant error, proportional error, the upper and lower confidence limits for constant and proportional error can be derived from the point estimates of constant and proportional error using their standard deviations using the following equations. And the error for the upper is your mean error plus t times s divided by the square root of n. And the lower is, is t mi e minus t times s divided by the square root of n. So we're always going to be looking at the upper in our portion, right? So you have constant error, the CU constant error upper limit is what we would use instead of the constant error lower limit, right? Because then we're going to sum all those together. The same thing with the comp for, for, for linear regression when we tested XC. We plug the, the YC in there, plus or minus this error term, and we want the upper limit, so the standard, the systematic error upper limit. So, and the confidence interval, the total error is always the worst case combination of the random and systematic errors. So you're going to take that worst case combination and that'll be your estimate for the total error. So that way you're 95% confident that the total error is going to be less than the allowable error if it is in fact the less than the allowable error. So, and that's the total error. Upper confidence limit is equal to the square root of the square of the random error upper limit plus W squared, and then square root of all of that plus the, the standard error, or systematic error. That's the lower, and that's the end of the show today. And there's a, there's a, in that green book, they go through all of the, the procedures for, for doing a comparative method, I think using glucose. You can read through that in the back of the chapter, and it has all the calculations of what they do, and they come up with the, they actually plot it on that six sigma chart and everything. So, have a look at that too. Okay. I don't know if there's going to be any of those equations on the test like that per se, but I might ask you questions related to those. I'm not going to make you do those calculations per se, but there'll definitely be theoretical questions on those. So. Okay.